Hi folks, welcome to the channel. If you're a new or returning subscriber, please remember to like our videos, provide comments to help us with continuous improvement to our content, share with friends and family, and most importantly, subscribe. Thank you. at product stability and let's look at it from a wider uh, context so product it doesn't matter whether the product is modular or whether the product is constituted of multiple parts to define that product functionality a product's a product so the, the void of that you know when designing the product it should have some measure of stability so when we think about the word stability the first word that pops to mind will be stable so we can then define product stability as probably um, an object's um, ability to um, not to be disturbed or to not topple over or to be balanced uh, devoid of how it's being disturbed by some form of external stimulus so i've gone on to define stability from a designer's perspective as follows so stability from a design perspective can be defined as the product's ability to sustain its balance when disturbed or forced to rotate by some form of load. Okay, so that's fairly uh, straightforward. So we can then proceed to look at what are the variables that impact a product stability. So stability in products is dependent on the following. So we can look at um, the geometric profile or parameters of the object. So we're looking at the height, the width, the length that defines the size of the product. And why is it important? It's important because dependent on the size of the product and the distances of um, the various parts that constitute the product to its centroid or sense of gravity, that will dictate how stable the product's likely to be. We can also look at the aerial coverage or the contact between the object and some form of defined surface. So this brings us to this diagram here. So if you look at the first diagram, that's captured in stable equilibrium. Its base is quite wide in terms of the area of contact that it makes with the surface, thus giving it better uh, stability. If you compare it to the second diagram, you realize that the area of contact is quite minute, thus the object becomes quite unstable. So the slightest force will cause the object to topple over. So we need to bear that in mind. When it comes to the third diagram, we were talking about neutral equilibrium. No matter how the object rotates, in terms of the distance between its focal point of contact on the surface to the position of the center of gravity, it still stays the same, thus neutral. So again, the geometric profile and the shape and form also has a bearing on how stable an object is likely to be. So shape and form. And the last part will be the location, position of the center of gravity, which is dependent on the size of the product. Now, one bit that I actually left out here has to do with the material constitution of the product. So as I stated, if a product is constituted of multiple um, components and these components are defined by different material that can dictate you know the position of the centroid in terms of how that then affects the overall stability of the product so these are some of the things that we do need to bear in mind as um, designers and engineers let's look at the second diagram at the bottom so we've got a stool and in the diagram, it shows that the stool has more or less the same height. But if you look at the bottom, you realize that the base is quite wide in terms of the space between the stool legs. So the first diagram shows a wider uh, stance of the table leg to the center of gravity, thus giving it better uh, stability compared to um, diagram two. So 
Diagram 2 is quite stable, but not as stable as Diagram 1. So again, you know, the narrower the span is in terms of the width of an object, the more unstable it becomes over time. So the closer and closer the legs are to the center of gravity, the more unstable the design becomes. But let's look at it in a greater context. So how does this affect how stable um, the product is in terms of having a wider uh, base or aerial coverage? So let's look at the first diagram that's depicted to be very stable. And we need to look at the distance between the point of rotation and the center of mass. So the wider um, the base or the wider the span of the object, the greater the distance of rotation between the focal point of turning in terms of um, the object toppling over to the center of mass as shown in the diagram here. So the distance from A to the center of mass. So the larger that distance x1, the greater the tipping angle, theta1. When we come to diagram 2, you realize that the narrower the legs are to the center of gravity, the smaller x2 becomes, thus reducing the distance between A, which would be the focal point of rotation of the object when disturbed by some form of external load that's going to generate some form of moment to topple the object, and the center of mass. As a result, the tipping angle becomes a bit lower in comparison to diagram one. And when we look at Diagram 3, where it's defined as being unstable. You realize that you've gotten to the point whereby the center of gravity is displaced further away from A. So look at diagram 1. You realize that the center of gravity, the position of the segment of gravity, is behind the position of the point of rotation. Likewise for diagram 2, the center of rotation is in front of the position of the center of gravity. However, if you look at diagram three, you realize that now the center of um, the position of rotation point A now lags behind the position of the center of gravity, thus making it unstable. So the more you can control the tendency of the points of rotation lagging behind that of the center of gravity, the better the stability of the product. So this is basically the interpretation in terms of, you know, the stability and how unstable the product is and using the geometric profile of um, a given product to assess at what point would the point of rotation lag behind the position of the center of gravity to ensure that the product isn't unstable. So that's fairly um, straightforward. Now look at centroid and center of mass, how they differ to a certain extent. When it comes to centroids, we're looking at the geometric profile of the object and how that defines the center of that object. So that's essentially what the uh, centroid is all about. However, when it comes to the center of mass, the center of mass is the single focal point of where all the masses of the object is concentrated at. And the masses, as I pointed out um, previously in the, in the previous slide, is defined by the materials that constitute the components that forms the object. And that's essentially the difference between the centroid and the center of mass. The instant where the center of mass and the centroid will more or less be the same is if the material made of, uh, that constitutes the product is homogeneous throughout, meaning it's a single material that forms the entire um, product. So as a result, the center of mass and the centroid will be located at the same position. However, let's look at this situation whereby you've got an object that have more or less has the same geometric profile as um, the first diagram, but it's constituted of two different materials. So what will happen is, the center of gravity will shift towards the material with the higher density. So the heavier the material, the greater the shift of the centroid to um, the heavier 
object or the heavier material. So that's why you realize that it's moved, you know, uh, closer to material B as compared to material one. So again, um, dependent on, you know, the material constitution of the component, um, the centroid and the center of mass will either uh, vary or be the same. Okay. Um, again, you can also use the term center of balance and you can also use the term center of gravity. But if we're being very uh, particular when it comes to center of gravity, if we're looking at, you know, localized um, changes in terms of the gravitational field that constitutes the object, then yeah, you can use center of gravity. But, you know, it makes more sense on a planetary scale as compared to, you know, um, a small uh, scale when we're dealing with products. So, you know, while we tend to use the term center of gravity, I don't know, but it more or less kind of like means the same thing in terms of how the masses are more or less constituted. So there you go. So moving on. So in terms of examples of centroids, in terms of um, regular shapes, I've provided these examples here. So if you've got regular forms like your squares, your circles, your triangles, your pen, uh, polygons, so this is a five um, sided shape, so that's your pentagon, your octagon, um, your five pointed star, yada yada yada. Just by drawing two diagonals from um, their respective corners, or in terms of um, a circle, just you know tracing di uh, diameters from different points along uh, its circumference, where they intersect will more or less give you the centroid position. And there you go. So for regular forms, it's very easy to work out the centroid position. Fairly straightforward. And all that you have to do is to define some form of reference and measure the distance of the centroid to um, your reference uh, point to identify what the coordinations is likely to be. So fairly straightforward stuff. So what's the significance of centroids? So when we're looking at it from a design perspective, so we've talked about um, ensuring that um, products are stable when affected by some form of external load. So I think that's pretty straightforward. And again, you can use these concepts to define what would be the measure of the, t uh, the toppling angle or the tipping angle to ensure that the point of rotation is always leading the position of uh, the centroid of the product. We can also use centroids to assess the usability of a product. So we've got this streamer here or this grass trimmer and the location of the motor to the cutter is important to ensure that it's very easy to manipulate when during use. So having an understanding of centroids does help, you know, to a certain extent, the human factor elements when it comes to um, product use. So something might uh, worth thinking about. We can also use the concept of centroid sensibility to optimize uh, loading within um, the assembly of a product. So you've got this uh, truck and the position of the engine, uh, the powertrain, the gearbox, the wheels, the chassis assembly, um, in terms of um, the cargo and other things that the vehicle is going to you know, carry, all that will have a bear on how stable the vehicle is likely to be. So by having a good understanding in terms of um, centroids and sense of mass and sense of gravity, at least that helps you to define what will be the ideal span and look uh, span of certain uh, components that constitutes the product to ensure that the product is stable. What would be the best location for setting subsystems within the product assembly? Things like that to optimize or to reduce the tendency of any disturbing or any unbalanced loading causing um, instability within the product. There you go. Now, another bit that we can actually use centroids for is when we're doing structural analysis, particularly when we're assessing um, the measure of how much a structure is bending when a transverse force is applied to it. 
So that using these concepts enables to establish what's called the neutral axis. So the neutral axis more or less defines the point to where the stresses within um, the component equals to zero. Okay, so you're not having any measure of elongation or reduction in um, the uh, radius of curvature in terms of the structure. So there you, but you know, feel free to think about other ways that the centroid, you know, an understanding of the centroid can support um, designers and engineers. So I'll let you guys digest on that. Bye-bye,